Uh, so, yeah, thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, my name is Jan van Valberg. Um, I work as a technical director at Activision uh, CTN in the UK, from Activision Central Tech. Um, I wrote a build server called Compass, which is used for all the automated testing and profiling and continuous integration for all of the Call of Duty games. And in this talk, I'm going to talk a bit about how Compass came to be and what it looks like and how it works and how we use it. So I actually work for a, a small Activision satellite tech group in the UK called Central Technology North. And we get assigned to help out on different games as needed. And back in 2011, we were helping out with Bungie's new game called Destiny. So at the time, Bungie didn't have the automated testing infrastructure yet that they have now. You might have heard of like a system that they have, the Gauntlet. But um, back in 2011, they didn't have that yet. So sometimes you might grab the code, and it wouldn't work, and then you might not necessarily know whether it's your fault, or whether it's someone else's fault, or when it might have broken. Um, and th this was a particular problem for us, because we were in the UK, so we were in a separate office, in a separate time zone, and also we were the first people working on the PlayStation 3 version. So to help us, I set up a little build server which would build and run Destiny on PlayStation 3, just over and over again to check whether it was still working. So I'd been experimenting with different build servers, and one that I really liked was one called BuildBot. So BuildBot is an open source build server written in Python. It's used by various people like Mozilla uh, and also Chromium, which is the open source part of the Google Chrome browser. Um, and the UI that the people from Chromium have built for it was really interesting. Uh, I instantly fell in love with this, their console page. So at the top, you can see the overall states of the build, of like all the different bits of the build. And then down here, you can see each horizontal row is a check-in, and then each box represents whether a particular test is working or not working for that check-in. It's very information dense. And in uh, all the other build servers that I used before, in order to get all of this information, you'd have to like, click through loads of different pages. So it was really cool to see it all in one place. And the other thing that I liked about BuildBot was the way that the build was configured. So in other build servers that I used, the way you would like, configure tasks and builds would be by going onto a web app and then like, clicking buttons and entering text in there. Uh, with BuildBot, you configured it using, using Python code like this. Um, and this, doing it like this is known as configuration as code. And I'll explain why this is so great later on. So I got this automated testing up and running with BuildBot. Um, but there were still a couple of things that I wasn't happy with. I still had some things on my wish list. So first of all, BuildBot didn't know about dev kits. So if uh, one of our PlayStation 3s was unresponsive or was broken in some way, or maybe it was just off, uh, the test would keep running, and they would try and run on the PlayStation, and they would fail, and everything would go red, even though there wasn't actually anything broken. It was just the PlayStation that was off. Um, so I thought it'd be really nice to have a build server that could understand about PlayStations, just as a worker PC. If it's off, it wouldn't try and run a task on it. It'd be cool if it wouldn't try running tasks on PlayStations if they were off or, or if they were broken in some way. Um, and also, although the configuration was done in Python, if you change the configuration, you still had to copy it onto the server and then click a button to have it reloaded. Whereas what I would like, what I liked, was to have the configuration come directly from source control. So when you check the configuration into source control and it immediately like, takes that on board, updates it. And then the last thing um, that uh, was on my wish list um, was to have a deep integration uh, of like metrics, like stats about the game and screenshots of the game into the build server itself. Um, we built this type of stuff before, like on top of existing build servers, but it always felt a bit sort of separate. I had this vision that you could like have a graph of CPU performance. And if you saw, saw it spike up, that you'd be able to like, hover over it and see exactly which change list caused that spike. Um, so yeah, I wanted a build server that could do all of these things, but there wasn't one. 
So I decided to write my own build server from scratch, and this became a hobby project during Destiny 1. And I would work on it in my spare time, and like during the flights and in the hotel room where we were visiting Bungie. And that's basically how Compass was born. So after working on Destiny, my group was moved onto Call of Duty Advanced Warfare uh, from Sledgehammer Games. And I set up Compass for them as well. And at this point, Compass was still running out of our office in Warrington, so it was just like a couple of PCs that were cobbled together and some dev kits that we had lying around. Uh, and then the next project that we worked on was uh, Call of Duty Infinite Warfare. And for that one, at Infinity Ward, we decided we were going to have a proper server actually at Infinity Ward, and um, very soon we had like hundreds of VMs and dozens of dev kits uh, all running stuff. And Compass there, the, the goal was to kind of have Compass replace all of the stuff, like to build all of the CI and all of the build server infrastructure on top of Compass. Um, that ended up being really popular. And the other studios soon all also adopted Compass for everything. And as I said, Compass is now used for, for all automated testing and CI across all Call of Duty games. So here are some numbers to give you an idea of the scope of uh, automated testing uh, across all Call of Duty games. So across all the studios working on Call of Duty, we have about 700 worker PCs right now. So they could be VMs, or they could be physical PCs. Each one has at least four cores. Some of them have more. Um, and then we have 300 dev kits. So that's all the Playstations and Xboxes across all the studios. Um, we have just short of about 1,000 unique users using Compass. So this could be people looking at the web app to check the states of the build, um, or it includes people like kicking off pre-submit builds from the desktop to test their changes before they get checked in. Um, and then we run, last time I checked, about 50,000 tasks per day. So 50,000, the equivalent of Jenkins jobs per day. Uh, so that's about one task every other second. Um, so here are some things that each studio typically runs on, on their build server. So we have the CI, which is the usual thing that you, you, you'd imagine to have, which is a build that gets triggered for every check-in. Um, we aim to complete these in about 30 minutes. Um, we run multiple builds in parallel, so if there's more than one check-in coming in between in that 30 minute space, we'll be able to cover those. We don't like skip those. And the type of stuff that we do in that is compile the game code, compile the tools, convert the assets, and then we run the game on maybe three or four maps um, on all the target platforms. And then there'll be other type of things that we do, like other tests that we add to that, like we have, for example, device debug, which runs the game with um, D3D device debug enabled, so you get like the extra errors coming out. Testing the dedicated server, um, extra unit tests. Um, and then every studio also has a thing called all maps, so the all maps build tests, it does boot tests on every single map in the game on at least one target platform, sometimes two. And this takes a little bit longer to complete, so it's not necessarily for every check-in. We just kind of test all of the maps, and then when that's done, we run another build and test all maps again, and that's maybe about every hour. Um, we take the screenshots of that as well and present that to the users, so they can kind of see uh, in one go whether all of the maps are currently booting, and whether they kind of look correct. Um, and then we'll have a release build, like um, that basically builds a full package version of the game, something that you could send to QA or something that you could put on a disc. That can take a while longer to complete, depending on like the actual packaging on some platforms can take a long time. Um, and then we have the other stuff like branch maintenance. So with the CI, uh, studios will often have like, multiple branch. Maybe there'll be like a release branch and a dev branch or something like that. And the CI will then run in multiple branches, like in each one of those branches. And we have branch maintenance builds, which will do things like automatically integrate changes from, like if you made a change in release, maybe it'll automatically try and merge that into dev. Um, every 20 minutes or something like that. And then we'll also have like gated merges back up again. So Compass will like take the code from dev, 
test it for you, and then give you a button for people to click to release that to the more stable branch. So next, uh, I'd like to show you a bit about the UI. So I always find it fascinating to see what other people's tools look like. So um, I'll show you some of ours, and maybe it'll give you some interesting, uh, maybe it'll be interesting for you, it'll give you some inspiration. So this is the, the signature page of Compass, uh, which is the, what we call the console page. And as you can see, it's inspired by Chromium's console page. So as I said, each horizontal row is a check-in. New check-ins come in at the top, so it's kind of like a source control history. Um, the topmost, uh, each box represents the result of a task that ran or failed. So you can see the empty task appearing, and then they go yellow when they're running, and then when they're finished, they go green, or if they failed, they would go red. Um, and the columns from left to right are kind of like uh, ordered by time as well. So on the left hand, you'd have like compiling the code, and then further to the right, it would be converting the assets, then it would be actually running the game. This is a time-lapse video, by the way. Our builds don't actually come in that quickly, and they don't complete that quickly either, unfortunately. So here's an example where you can see someone made a check-in over here, and it goes red. And then a couple of builds later, a couple of check-ins later, the fix comes in, and you can see these specific two things go green again. So this page is perfect for like looking at the current status of the build, and if something is red, you could just kind of scroll down and see where it broke, like who broke it or, or when it broke. And you can also use it, like if you've done a check-in, you can kind of watch it and watch it go through and make sure that everything is okay. If the check-ins come in faster than the build server can handle, it will skip the tasks. So uh, these then show up on the console page as translucent boxes. So for example here, you see a bunch of check-ins came in in a very short space of time. And then that's caused these tasks here to get skipped. And the boxes have gone translucent. We have tooltips. So you can hover over a cell and then quickly find out what caused the error, if there was an error. So in this case, you see uh, the running of the game failed there. And then when you hover over it, you can see that the game's crashed. And you can see the call stack uh, of the crash. Um, something that we added recently is a feature called the include complexity measurement. So include complexity refers to uh, C++ has includes. So it's looking at every CPP file and then recursively going through and counting how many header files that CPP file brings in. And then we do that for every single CPP file in the project and add them all up. And the number that you get, that's our include complexity. Um, and then when you make a check-in, if you've added an include somewhere, you get a little arrow going up or down to say whether you've made the include complexity worse or whether you've made it better. And we've had a lot of positive feedback about this. People like the feedback on whether they've actually made the code base better or worse, um, because quite often you might do some like tidying up, but you don't kind of get much reward for your efforts. And this gives you a very a clear reward, a clear incentive. It makes people feel more responsible for keeping the code tidy. Another little feature that we added is this, the build tag. So if someone, the person that's made this check-in over here, before they did that check-in, they tested their change on a build server in, with a pre-commit build. And if they do that, they get this little manual build checkbox next to their change. So that lets them know that they've done a good thing. But it also lets everyone else know that if something does go wrong on here, it's probably not that guy's fault. He's, he has tested his stuff properly. Um, we have uh, screenshots to the right hand of the page as well. So this actually turned out to be a really good idea as well. It turns out that for people that have never seen Compass, when they say the screenshots, they kind of intuitively get, OK, so for this change list, Compass is running the game on that change list. And then it's taking these screenshots. So they kind of understand, even if nobody's explained anything to them, OK, Compass is running the game, and the game is OK for this particular change. And of course, having it capture the screenshots is super useful as well for kind of picking up on small visual changes that might have snuck in. You'll be able to like look at those changes and then go back through the history and find out when something has changed. 
Um, one thing that we do struggle with is fitting all this information horizontally on the screen. There's a limited amount of horizontal space, obviously. And um, for big builds like the Nightly build, where we test every single map on every single platform, um, it just doesn't fit. And so we added this scroll bar. Uh, another thing that we did find as well is this high density of information can put some people off. Some people kind of get scared by looking at this page. Um, so it, we found that it's still useful to have a big overall traffic light page of like, is the whole build red or is the whole build green? And here's an example of what we have for Infinity Ward. So for their main and their dev branch, these, these big panes go red or green, basically, depending on whether the build is working or not. And if the build is broken, you just get the list of errors here. So this, is, uh, this screen is displayed, displayed on TVs in the IW common room, for example. Um, it's perfect for that kind of use case, whereas if you try to put the console page with all the little boxes on a screen on a TV, it's just too much information. You can't see what's going on. So this is, this is the measurements page. So this has got that deep integration between the stats and the build server that I was talking about. So this page uh, is showing the number of shader assets in the game. So um, along the x-axis, it's basically the build number. So every build is a check-in. And then the, the value, the number of assets, is along the y-axis. And then every dot on this graph represents one build. So it represents one check-in. Um, if you were to scroll further down the page, you get this. So you get to see all the other stats that are associated with that task, so like all the other stats for a particular run of the game, for example, um, or an asset conversion. Um, so here's a chart that shows the game's asset sizes over time. You get little spark lines on the right-hand side, so you can see the number of assets in the game is kind of like steadily going up and up and up and up, as you would expect. And then in the middle, you see that something caused uh, some of the asset counts to drop. So if you were to click on that, then you get to see it in the big graph over here, and then if you were to click on this dot here, which represents the build that caused the number of assets to drop, um, then you can see on the right-hand side that uh, the change list description for the thing that caused that change. So I don't know if you can read that, but someone's basically done a, an optimization or removed some unused assets from the build. So here is a, a related page. This is what we call the nightly perf overview page. So every night we run uh, a test. We run the game on every single map, and then we teleport the player to different locations on that map, and we stay at every location for about 20 seconds, 30 seconds, and we capture performance data of the game. Um, and then the results of all of those perf captures are presented, they're aggregated, and they're presented on this page. So each of these rows is a different map. And then each of these columns is a different screenshot location. And then these are the different stats. So this tells you the percentage of time that the game is running at or above 60 frames per second, which is our target frame rate. And then you have GPU time, CPU time in milliseconds. If you have a yellow cell, that means that it's bordering on going over budget. And if you have red cell, it's over budget. Um, we also show these up and down arrows. So that tells you, compared to the previous nightly build, whether that particular timing has gone up or down. We have a popover again. So if you hover over a cell, you can see a screenshot, first of all. So you get an idea of what is the location that's having this bad performance. And you get this graph that shows you the kind of state, the kind of history of that particular measurement over the last week or month or so. So you get a bit of an idea for whether performance has been getting better or whether it's been getting worse. And then you can click on this cell, and that would then take you to the big uh, graph where you can dig into, OK, well, if the GPU performance has got worse, exactly which part of the GPU performance has gotten worse? Is it opaque or post effects or whatever? So this page is used a lot by artists because it allows them to look at their map and figure out which bits are slow, and then maybe they'll optimize that particular location, and then check in their change, and then the next day they come back, and they'll have another look and see, has my optimization worked? Um, do I need to optimize it any further? 
Something that's worth mentioning is the way we come up with these screenshot locations um, is we have testers play the game, and then based on their playthroughs, they try and figure out like what are the slow bits on the map, what are the kind of worst bits for performance, and then we basically take the coordinates of those locations and check them into a text file in Perforce, and then Compass reads that text file, and that's the list of screenshot locations that it uses here. Um, so something that we specifically don't do is we don't have anything, we don't have like a bot that tries to like automatically play through the game. Um, partially because it would be very hard. Um, it's just something that humans are much better at being able to figure out, you know, like all, visiting all the nooks and crannies and trying to figure out sort of, or preempt where the game might be performing badly. Um, I guess the point is that like for us, automated testing doesn't necessarily mean that we take what a tester does and try and automate it. We kind of take the, bit, take the bits, the boring bits, right, the, the easy to automate bits, um, and automate those things, and then that frees the tester up to do the more like things that humans are good at, like exploratory testing. Okay, so next, I'd like to talk a bit about how Compass works on the inside. So one of the things that's different uh, about Compass compared to many other build servers is the way that tasks work, or what is called jobs in Jenkins. So the most common way that jobs uh, would be configured in build servers would be via a web UI, right? So these would be examples in Jenkins of setting up the running of a shell command, for example. And in Compass, all of this is done using Python. So instead of filling out a GUI form, uh, we have just a bunch of function calls. And all the fields that you'd normally put in like the web app GUI form, you just pass them in as parameters into your function. So this would be an example in Jenkins of how you run a shell command. You, you get this thing up and then you put the shell command in there. And in Compass, the same thing would be this line of code. So you just call the, the shell command function sh and you pass in that same thing as an argument. Um, this is another example. This is what it would build, look like to build a Visual Studio solution. So you just call this build solution function and that then invokes MS build and it like scrapes the output and gets all the warnings and the errors out, that kind of thing. And here's another example of how you would set up a Perforce repository in Jenkins and in Compass. So in Compass, each task is basically just a Python function. And we call this code automation scripts. So here would be a simple example of some of the things that you might find in a compass task. So you would call the sync function, that syncs your source control. Then sh, that runs a shell command. Um, measurement, that's how you would measure, register a new measurement. So all the stuff that I showed you, like uh, tracking uh, number of assets, or like memory data, or like perf stats, that would all be registered using this function. And then store, if you had to like, output something, maybe if you're compiling an XE, you want to store the XE so another task can use it, you'd use a store function. And if you were to run something like that inside Compass, it would look like this. So you can see each of these functions that you're calling match up with steps here. So sync dev step and the shell echo hello world step. And then if you click on that, you can get to see the, the output over there. So Compass also has an API for talking to dev kits. So that's, that's like a wrapper around the um, API that you get from Sony or Microsoft to talk to the Xbox and the PlayStation. And it allows you to do things like upload files, download files from the dev kit, launch your game, take screenshots, uh, capture crash dumps. So here would be an example where you you get hold of a PlayStation 4, then you reset the PlayStation 4, you launch your game, um, you wait for 20 seconds, and then you capture a screenshot of whatever is on screen at that point. Um, usually, our automated tests, once the game is launched, will also open a socket connection directly to the game so that we can control the game then as well. So we'll send the commands like uh, teleport to a different location, or go to a different map, or fire your gun, um, or like start the performance capture, start writing out a CSV file with performance data. So what are the benefits to doing this? What are the benefits to having these things as Python scripts? Um, so you can run and test automation scripts locally, because they're just Python scripts. They're not tied to your build server necessarily. So you can just like run them on your own PC, completely independent from your build server. And that's actually how most of these things get written. Um, 
it is easy to write and easy to understand because Python is an easy language. And um, you also have all the power of Python. So Python has this massive ecosystem with thousands of packages that do everything from like numerical analysis or like image manipulation. And you can just make use of all that stuff really easily. Um, but then the biggest benefits arguably come from the fact that your configuration is checked into source control. So the benefits there are you have a history, for example, right? So if someone makes a change to the configuration, you can just look it up in source control and see who changed it and see what changed and when. Um, you have the ability to run, rerun old check-ins. So if you imagine changing, let's say you had to rename a directory and you had some configuration that points to that directory. Um, the way normally you might have to do that is by just renaming directory and then the build would break and then you'd have to go onto your build server and change the configuration to point to the new directory and then it would be green again, right? But it does mean that the build is broken for a little while and it also means that if you were to try and build an older change list, now that wouldn't work anymore because you're now pointing to the wrong directory. Um, if you have your configuration in source control, you can basically check your configuration and the rename of directory in at the same time and everything will just continue to work exactly as it should. Um, another nice benefit is that you can test your configuration in a proof build. So if you want to make a configuration change, you can actually see whether it works. You can add more jobs and add more dependencies or like try out new resources um, just using a pre-submit build, a manual build. And the whole rest of the build server will just continue to work exactly as it is. So your little manual build is isolated. You can know that when you actually make that config change, it will definitely work. So that's really cool. Um, branching your code gets potentially easier because the, the configuration gets branched along with the rest of your code. Um, and then the last point, which is quite interesting, is that because you have this stuff checked into source control, it makes it easier for people to change things themselves. Whereas if you had um, your build server all being managed on the build server itself, you might have like a build server guy or maybe a couple of build server guys that are responsible for making changes to the build server. And if you were a programmer and you wanted to add a test or you wanted to add a task, you might have to talk to these guys um, to make changes to that. Whereas by checking the configuration into source control, it allows anyone to change this stuff, right? So that's potentially quite powerful. Um, there are drawbacks as well. So there is a learning curve. There's a learning curve in terms of like learning Python and learning the API, but also in terms of um, it's different from how other build servers work, so people kind of have to understand that first. Um, and there's more difficulty you get going initially as well. So if you, you know, set up Jenkins, you could just type in a command into the web app, and it will just run immediately. But with Compass, you can't do anything until you've got some automation scripts actually checked into source control. So in order to help people get over this initial learning curve, I actually did most of the original setup and kind of maintained the scripts to begin with. And then uh, I wrote documentation, and the studios kind of learned how to uh, write this stuff and like test this stuff themselves. And then over time, uh, they've taken over the ownership until like each studio now owns all of their own automation scripts themselves. So a quick note on provisioning. So in order to run Compass tasks, every worker PC needs to have software on there. You need Python for starters, but you also need Visual Studio and like, the Xbox and PlayStation SDK. So, so how do we get that software onto the workers? So right now, we manage all the software installation using something called Puppets. Puppets is open source software. The way it works is every 20 minutes, every, every worker PC connects to a Puppet master. And the Puppet master knows what software should be installed on every worker. And the worker then checks that against what's actually installed. And together, they figure out if something needs uninstalling or something new needs installing. And um, that works fine, although it does, it, it's not a natural thing necessarily to install things from the command line, which is what required here. But that doesn't always come uh, natural to all Windows programs. Um, making sure that the right version of Visual Studio is installed with all the right optional extras. Um, getting all of that stuff to work is actually one guy's full-time job across all the studios. Um, and there are also potential issues like if you install Visual Studio on 100 workers, maybe it'll fail on like five of them. And then if you run a build on one of those workers, 
that will fail and someone has to go investigate why it's failing and try and sort of fix Visual Studio on those workers. Um, another problem that we have is if we want to roll out a new SDK, let's say, we'd have to like check in the code for the new SDK and then we kind of have to like pause Compass for maybe 20 minutes or 30 minutes, however long it takes for Puppet to like push out this new change to all of the workers and then we can like turn it back on again. Um, and also, once this new SDK is installed on all the workers, we can't sort of easily go back again. So if you wanted to run an older build that requires that old SDK, like you can't do that easily. So actually, it kind of breaks some of the benefits that you get from uh, using this configuration as code checked into Perforce. So to get around some of those problems and limitations, we're actually looking at switching to Windows containers. Containers are like a little lightweight VM and you install all your software into the VM, and then you upload that VM to all of your workers, and the workers can then almost instantly, within like 10, 20 seconds, switch between different VMs. So that fixes a lot of the problems that we had before. For example, we, know we don't need to like pause Compass anymore. We can just like instantly switch between an older or a newer SDK. Um, the only issue with containers is that it's still, especially in Windows, it's a very new technology. So we're still working with Microsoft and Sony to kind of iron out the last few kinks, but we're, we're hopeful to be able to start uh, rolling out and start using containers for everything this year. So next, um, I wanted to talk a bit about uh, a couple of interesting features in Compass, namely error bucketing and auto redry. So one interesting thing that we do in Compass is error bucketing. When you do loads of automated testing on like a big scale, you're going to get errors, and they're not always necessarily going to be problems with people's check-ins. Um, they could be dev kits failing in mysterious ways. There might be a bug in the asset conversion, which causes a worker to end up in a weird state, which then causes builds to fail on that specific worker. Or maybe there's a race condition in the game that means that it'll crash every one in a hundred times. And so to get a better handle on those kind of issues, those kind of intermittent issues, uh, we added a feature in Compass to track the occurrence of errors, to make it easier to figure out how often they happen and when they happen or when they started happening. So what we do is, anytime a task fails, we produce a single sentence summary of the error that caused the task to fail. And we do that by looking at the log file and kind of going through the first couple of lines of error messages in the log file. So in this case, it would be this block here. And then based on that bit of text, we generate this unique error key. So in this case, this would be the error key. It's, it's an assert in the game. And the task failure is then bucketed based on that error. So all, each bucket will contain all of the tasks that failed with that error. Um, so whether it's an assert or an out of memory error or a def kit not working, they'll all have their own buckets that you can look at. This idea is quite common with the crash dumps. You might like, when you send out your game, you might collect crash dumps back and then you might collect, uh, you might bucket those crash dumps based on the call stacks. So this is basically the same idea, but instead of bucketing crash dumps, you're bucketing failures in your build server. And this error, to, error bucketing then gives us some useful information. So here is the error bucket page for an unable to allocate memory uh, error. And as you can see, it has a little calendar view. So here, every square represents a day, and the color of the square represents how many times this error occurred on that particular day. So you can see it started, the first occurrence was on this day, which is probably when we started tracking it. And then you can see over here in January, there seems to be an uptick of out-of-memory errors. And then further down the page, you get this list of occurrences, recent occurrences. So um, here you can see this error appears to be happening in run game MP battle XP3. So that, so that looks like the MP battle map on Xbox One is running out of memory. Um, on the right-hand side, you can also see uh, a column with resource names. So if there's a particular error that keeps happening on the same dev kit or on the same worker PC, then you'll be able to just see the same name appearing over and over again, and you'll know, okay, it's, it's a specific problem with this PlayStation or whatever. You can also associate information with the error bucket itself. So for example, this error has uh, a bug associated with it, a JIRA issue. 
So this is very handy for knowing whether uh, someone is working on a particular error. So for example, if I trigger a build and I get an error, and I can see that a JIRA is associated with it, I can just look it up and I can see, okay, I can know that this is something that's happened before. I can see any discussion that's going on about it. Maybe someone is working on it, so I know who's working on it. I can see maybe they've already fixed it, but the, the fix hasn't been integrated into my branch yet. You get all that kind of knowledge from, from sort of tying these two things together. And then another feature that we have that's related to error bucketing is auto retry. So auto retry refers to the, the automatic retrying of tasks that failed. So personally, uh, the idea of automatically retrying failures used to horrify me. I used to think that if you have failures in your build, you should understand them and you should fix them. You should be on top of that. But it turns out that often there'll be rare bugs in there and it might not necessarily be the team's top priority to fix those rare bugs. Uh, in fact, sometimes there might just be things that are beyond your control. And these things still will be happening intermittently and then your build server will start sending out emails saying, hey, the build is broken and your big status page will go red, even though actually everything's fine. And this kind of like, it sort of picks away at the, uh, the confidence that people have in your build server and in the kind of the status reports that it's giving them. So what we do is, uh, for a particular error bucket, you can specify an action that's going to happen when that error happens, when something fills with that error. So for example, we could say, if a particular error happens, retry. So if we know that there's an intermittent error that happens once every 100 times, and we don't want the build to go red when this happens, we set it to auto retry. And then it'll retry that thing up to three times. Another thing that we can do is set the resource that the task ran on, in cooldown mode. So for example, if there's a particular error that you know that when this happens, that dev kit it can't be used right now, um, you can set it into cooldown mode. It'll retry that task on a different dev kit. And that dev kit is not allowed to run any tasks for the next five minutes. And that can be really useful because if you have a dev kit or a worker PC and anything that runs on it like immediately fails, very quickly, every single task that you have queued up will start running on that thing and they will all fail and everything will go red. So this kind of stops that from being like an epic problem and reduces it to a much smaller problem. You still need to fix this PlayStation, investigate it, but you don't have your entire build server going red. Um, and then we also have disable. So if you know for a particular error, this is definitely not going to be usable anymore, this, this resource, then you can just disable it permanently. So yeah, so this system does turn out to be very useful. It saves people a lot of time um, looking into really rare intermittent failures um, and also some of the manual work of disabling bro broken resources is now sort of done automatically. It can be unnerving for people. I definitely have the feedback that people don't like um, seeing like a task fail and then getting retried. Um, so I would say that if you're going to do something like this, you definitely need a way to surface the failed task as well. Like if you're an artist, Maybe you don't care about some infrastructure failure, failure, but if you're actually the person responsible for the infrastructure, then you might want to know exactly what happened. So you still need a way to surface that information. So what problems did we have with Compass? What was hard about writing Compass? So writing a fully featured build server obviously took a while, uh, but it was a gradual process. It's not like I kind of set out to write this all-encompassing thing. It started with a very simple, uh, program that solved a small issue and then kind of gradually grew from there. Um, one definite pain point was stability. For automated testing itself, if, the, if it fails, it's not too big a deal, but if your, your build server is producing gold master builds, then it needs to be 100% rock solid, and we have had problems with that. Um, one issue that we had was um, Compass would every so often kill every single running task on the entire server for no apparent reason. And it actually turns out that what would happen is if someone canceled the task, it would kill the process and it would try to kill all of the child processes in the process tree. But because of this third party package, a bug in a third party package that we're using, it would sometimes also randomly kill some other process that was unrelated. And every so often that process would be Compass itself. And then the whole thing would just reboot. And um, that was, it took some weeks to track that down and that was uh, quite stressful. 
We also uh, have run into issues with scalability. It's obviously easy to write a program that works with a couple of dev kits and a couple of PCs under your desk. But when we started scaling up to hundreds of machines and dozens of dev kits at Infinity Ward, um, I, I needed to like revisit that code and kind of optimize it. And another issue that we've struggled with as well, it's not specific to kind of Compass, but if you, you have like hundreds of dev kits and they're all running the game all the time, actually getting all of the new asset data to those dev kits takes up a lot of uh, bandwidth, network bandwidth. So we've had to devise systems to try and deal with that. For example, kind of split um, all our asset files into little bits and then only transfer the bits that have changed. Um, also, uh, again, this is a problem that you'll have with any kind of large-scale automation. You will get problems. Your game's going to change. New bugs will be introduced. Uh, compilers change. Maybe something's going to run out of disk space. Uh, even the behavior of your PlayStation or your Xbox is going to change as you flash it to a new version. And all this churn is just something that someone has to deal with. Um, and so if you have a lot of automation, you're going to have a lot of maintenance. There's no two ways about it. And, um, and that's why we've written things like the auto retry to try and reduce the maintenance load. Um, so I've shown you various features of Compass, the console page, the perf overview page. Um, I ended up writing this build server from scratch, but obviously I don't expect everyone looking at this talk to write their own build server. That would be insane. So to finish up with, I wanted to give you some tips on how you might be able to implement some of these features that I've shown you on top of your own existing um, automated testing infrastructure. So all the, all the UI, all this kind of web app UI that I've shown you, that's all written using Python and Flask. So Flask is very easy to get started with. There's loads of tutorials on the internet, so you shouldn't have much problems with that. Uh, so, so one approach that you could take is have your automated tests upload some data to the MySQL database, for example, and then you write a little Flask web app to then present your console page or whatever it is that you want, your you know, nightly perf page or whatever. Um, of course, there's loads of other ways to do it. You could write out just JSON files, or I think with Jenkins, you can write like plugins in Java, so that would be another way to go. Um, and then another thing I showed you was this, the, um, the graphing of performance and memory stats. And for this, you could, uh, you could take a look at InfluxDB and Grafana. So InfluxDB and Grafana are both open source software. InfluxDB is a database. It's like MySQL, let's say, but it's specifically designed for stats, for metrics. So you could have your automated test scripts that are producing stats, send those stats to InfluxDB, and then you could use Grafana to graph to generate graphs and dashboards from those stats. So Grafana is a web app that allows you to design your own graphs and your own dashboards, all via web UI. It's, it's very powerful. Um, it supports loads of databases. It supports InfluxDB, but also Prometheus, and I think MySQL even, uh, lots of other ones, Elasticsearch. So we actually, at Call of Duty, we also use Grafana ourselves because there's so much functionality in there, we didn't want to like replicate all of that stuff inside Compass. Um, and then, if your build server doesn't support configuration as code, you might be able to get some of the benefits by moving some of your uh, logic out of your build server's UI and into scripts that you check into source control. So the way that could work is um, you store your automation scripts in a separate directory, and your build server just syncs that directory, and then you run the script inside that directory, and that then syncs whatever else you need from source control, and then it will run whatever kind of steps you need to do as part of your automated testing and your CI. Um, there are some trade-offs with doing that. For example, all your log output by default would appear in one single log file in your build server. And I guess like your build server might also already have some functionality like um, building Visual Studio solutions, for example, and you might have to write some Python code to replicate that functionality. So there's, there is some trade-offs there. So that's the story of Compass. I hope this has given you a bit of an insight into what goes on to the testing of Call of Duty and making Call of Duty in general. Um, I just wanted to thank all my colleagues at Activision Central and at all the Activision Studios for all their day-to-day -day helping out with Compass. It's a big project, and we wouldn't be able to do it with lots of other people's help. And finally, if you'd like to talk to me about any of these topics, um, I'd love for you to get in touch. 
Uh, my contact details are just over there. And uh, also, Active Union is hiring both uh, right here in this city, in the UK, and of course also in America. So you can visit jobs.activision.com if you're interested in that. And, um, and that's all I've got. Thank you very much. The last chance to ask questions for today. Please come, here, come over here so we can record your question. First of all, thank you for a fantastic lecture. It's totally impressive. Oh, thank you. Uh, my question, uh, internally we are trying to build something similar. We are building our build server from scratch and I faced uh, one issue with something that you have done in a wonderful way. Uh, this thing that you have described this with uh, frame rate uh, capturing, you described that you just teleport a player to random locations and uh, rotate him or something and wait to capture frame rate for 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. but in our case, I mean, I, I was, for me it is very hard because uh, uh, on Windows machines, if you are doing it on uh, different machines, then do they have all the same specification? And what if on one of them, uh, Windows will decide to make system update and take half of CPU or someone will minimize yeah. game of window or change resolution or do anything else in the background or whatever. Yes. Yeah, so <clears throat> we look, most of the time we look at like PlayStation and Xbox stats because like you say, there are a lot more, even taking all of the stuff that you mentioned out of the equation, it's just a lot more, sta a lot more reliable and a lot more stable, the measurements that we get out of that, whereas PCs, because there's always stuff running in the background, the kind of frame measurements are more noisy. Um, we do have, uh, we do generally have like, we'll have like sort of uh, a few dozen PCs that are kind of used for general testing. And then we'll have like maybe one or two specific PCs that are like, let's say AMD and NVIDIA min spec PCs. Um, and those would, it would just be one PC that we use uh, for our performance testing. So the nightly build would like run all of the maps on just this one specific AMD PC. So we don't have to worry about whether it's, whether the stats are the same between different PCs. Okay, thank you. So and then one last question. So uh, all these performance tests are doing, are done on uh, build, on a normal playable game somehow? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, welcome. Anyone else? Don't be shy. <laughs> Hi, I want to ask about how do you perform integration testing? Because I understand that you have unit testing, but how do you perform integration testing in game? Well, like, for example, shooting into the box, into the enemies, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, depending on the studio, we might just do boot tests, like for most of our stuff. Um, so, we just boot into the map and then check that that works, basically. Um, I think most studios have added some stuff over the top of it, and it, it, I didn't implement that stuff, so I don't know that much about it. But it would basically involve like <clears throat> they they write the like the they have like people that maintain these scripts, and they write tests, and they basically send commands to the game, and they'll just go like jump, throw a grenade, shoot, and like exercise various like bits of functionality basically, and then they'll just like take screenshots, and then they'll just make sure that like nothing crashes basically. Uh, if I can follow up uh, about taking screenshots, it's about, uh, for example, uh, taking screenshot after, for example, jumping or in a specific uh, time, or is it dealing otherwise? Um, I mean, the screenshots that we take are more kind of for people to look at rather than we don't. We don't currently really take screenshots and then kind of compare them against reference screenshots or anything like that. I don't know if that answers your question. So we wouldn't like mm -hmm. take a screenshot of him like being in the air to then somehow like automatically verify that he's actually jumped. Okay. Um, as far as I'm aware, we don't do that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you. I hope thank you, you enjoyed the last day of Digital Dragons.